holler if you hear me, and welcome to this edition of Luke Covers. James Bond was the original franchise to succumb to a fatal Phoebe Waller-Bridge poisoning. We know this, you know this, I know this, we all know this very, very well. And so do people in the access media, although they'll live in loser denial about it. And yes, Solo does not count. It was simply a symptom of a cause that is Kathleen Kennedy to the death of Star Wars. That a little ammonia-fused taste of what was to come with James Bond was right there and eventually spread over to Indiana Jones. But we're not here to take a black pill, ladies and gentlemen. What we're here for is to drop a dime on an alternative to James Bond, the Mission Impossible franchise. In the wake of people wanting something else after superhero movies have just come, and then it's not even a matter of coming and going, it's a matter of coming and staying and staying way too long. It reminds me of a actually funny Bill Maher line about how about Irish relatives. Yeah, superhero movies have been leaving like Irish relatives, not at all. So now you look at this and you think maybe some kind of spy action adventure sort of thing would happen. Except now James Bond also has gone under that weight. And now we are sitting around panicked waiting to see what kind of social justice trash is going to be infused on it. Now that they have the opportunity to replace James Bond with some intersectional checkbox in quote unquote human form. Even though they have about as much humanity as one of the replicants in Blade Runner. But uh, all these years, ever since around the mid-90s, when James Bond franchise first really came roaring back in the post-Cold War era of Hollywood, after all those years of legal issues between the production company that runs James Bond and the estate of uh, Mr. Ian Fleming, we got Mission Impossible. Yes. Oh, the irony that a franchise, a film franchise based on a TV show that was meant to be one of the upteenth televised James Bond wannabes has now become the cinematic juggernaut to usurp James Bond in the world of good old-fashioned global spy action adventure fun. Yes, Mission Impossible franchise has carried on and kept calm during the storm of social justice terror throughout Hollywood like an Englishman during the Blitz. How interesting to see this. In this day and age, the most stable figure in all of Hollywood is Tom Cruise. You know, the uh, entertainment industry is in full clown mode. We're in complete clown world with them. When the Scientologist who hopped on a couch like a freak in front of Oprah is the one saying to these uh, activists, with his actions, not really with his public statements, look, you nut bars, we should be trying to entertain So now we see Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 putting down Indiana Jones like old Yeller, and it's not really even fully out in theaters yet. Or maybe putting it down like Kathleen Kennedy already did to Indiana Jones, because King Cruz is fascinating with how he seems to prefer to have such long gaps between entries in the Mission Impossible series. Now, once you get something going, you want to crank it up and crank it up. How all the years of hesitancy for Deadpool to finally get made on the big screen within simply, I would say, it felt like maybe even minutes of when Deadpool had that great Valentine's Day opening weekend. Fox was already ready to go, and they kicked Ryan Reynolds back onto wherever the location was for Deadpool 2, and they had a teaser trailer for that thing roll around, really, I think it was New Year's or something, of the next year, and they still had a bit of production to go. But now, you look at Mission Impossible and see the long gaps One and two were released four years apart, then six years until the only J.J. Abrams film worth watching more than once, then five years until Ghost Protocol to show us all that Brad Bird needs to direct more live action stuff. Then it was only four until Rogue Nation, a paltry just three for Fallout, and it's taken five for this first of a two-part entry, although the pandemic may have had something to do with it this time. A most recent scandal, you would call it, involving Tom Cruise being when they were filming this two-part epic, there was him having the understandable out-and-set outburst with all of the crew, talking about how he's been on the phone with the studio all this time, how he's doing everything he can to make sure that this production goes, that we have these rules we have to deal with in order to get this movie made. We have to do all these things. This is the protocol we have to follow so we can keep on going. Considering I think it was Cruz with his own money 
who wound up just renting one big giant boat for the cast and crew on the film to be involved in, to be living on as they were still able to go and do the COVID protocols in the middle of producing this film or this two-part film now. So it makes me wonder just exactly how much we can really trust the budget on the movie since uh, this is supposed to be part one of two. Well, how much of this money was really going to just what we see in this first film? Same thing with the simultaneous production of Superman and Superman 2 all the way back in 70, and then the third, second one came out in, I believe, 1981. Since those films, most of them were made, most of Superman 1 and 2 were made simultaneously, and that's still, the original Superman was the most expensive movie at the time at $50 million. To put that perspective with inflation, the original Deadpool was somewhere between, I think, like 58 and $70 million. And that was considered the edgy, R-rated little thing that Ryan Reynolds had to spend a dozen years begging to get made. Yes. Just think about that for a bit. Let that swirl around in your mind. And still, with all of this going on, this is still a quicker turnaround for a Tom Cruise-related sequel than we got for Top Gun. So excited has Cruise made the public for him on the big screen again that Dead Reckoning Part 1 is projected to gross $250 million globally in its opening weekend against a $290 million budget. So, fingers crossed that it pulls an Avatar the way of water. They can't all make their budget back in a day like Sound of Freedom did, but they can all do everything they can to make sure that the mainstream studio thinking and the access media and all of the weirdly personal attacks against a film with a message that does not comply with what the likes of John Oliver's 12 viewers uh, want to think, giving you some interesting little Freudian insights into what's going on in their heads... But it can be a nice little fa little little fantasy to have. Dead Reckoning had its first preview day yesterday, so that means that this film is going to have a week-long opening weekend. Yes, it started its previews yesterday, preview screenings yesterday, and it was only in America, but then the full global opening is going to happen Wednesday. And this movie's has been doing this well, even though the domestic gross numbers from this preview day haven't really been even brought out as a basic estimate yet, but give it a little bit of time as of this recording. But positive hype around the film is all you've been hearing about it from online, from the people that are there talking about it online, you know, your from the access media, since this is somehow, in spite of all the uh, anti-Tom Cruise sentiment, which is coming from him proving the studio system wrong, rather than doing what he uh, than doing what he can to remind you all about how you need to audit yourselves and how you got to go clear. There is also the actual thinking audience out there that's talking online that is prefer reminding you all. Oh, wait, yeah, if you are going to just have a film that's about being a film, that's all about having a big budget action, good time, well, Tom Cruise has outdone himself with how well-received Top, Top Gun Maverick was. So, yeah, Dead Reckoning Part 1, check it out, check it out, check it out. If only Henry Cavill's character was allowed to stay around from the one in 2018, so then we can figure out what is he going to be in and what he's going to be doing until we are looking and with bated breath seeing just how well the Warhammer production comes out. But why is this so successful and so positively received online? Well, you only get what you give. And crews and cast have only ever given us talk about the movie instead of forcing more blue hair drivel down our throat. Carrie Elwes is in the film as the villain, I believe. And he's spouted stupid shit on social media before, but in interviews here, he's just talking about how it's the greatest action movie ever. Well, maybe he's grateful since the film is the biggest movie he's been in since Liar Liar, or maybe Tom Oldboy is smart and has the cast under a contract to not make any sociopolitical statements in promoting the movie. Cruz being as smart an operator as he is, I choose to believe the latter. You know Barbie's coming out soon, with Margot Robbie also quote-unquote producing, except for all the hype about her looking the part in the film, we still have dumbass co-stars parading around the film being, a f being all feminist. Then the below-average looking actress turns diversity hired director has to make a statement that the movie is humanist instead of feminist under obvious orders from the studio to avoid the feminist touch of death at the box office. Ask the actually feminist polemic of a movie known as Showgirls how receptive audiences have always been to that kind of crap. 
If anything, it's something else all productions should adopt. Gag orders on political statements from the cast during production of the movie. After enough recitations of deranged activists performing Kill, Kill, Kill the White Man by Eugene Mamaluka Bubude when promoting a superhero movie, Disney ought to get it by now. Unless they already have, and that explains ESPN laying off the 20 on-air Trevor Noah fans on their network. But that's giving Disney way too much credit. Unlike Tom, who deserves all the credit. On a Tom Cruise production, you know, he's the big papa. Everyone on set knows that they're working for him, from the key grip to the director. You're making a Tom Cruise movie, and Tom Cruise is the man who knows what it takes to make things work these days. That's why he deserves all the accolades from Steven Spielberg as the man who is saving Hollywood. And that's not my opinion. I know I'm right. I want to thank you all for watching. Subscribe if you're new. Check the digital subscribe if you're returning. And don't forget the best ways to support my channel is to become a member today with the first link or below or shop in my art store with the second link below. Or you'll see I have uh, uh, posters for 200, color art for 30, pen and ink art for 25, sketchbooks for 25, and trading cards for 10. Commissions in color are 60, pen and ink commissions are 50, trading card commissions are 20. And whatever commission or purchase you make just has a $5 shipping and handling fee. And you can also donate. Donations are the first thing in my store and any denomination around the world is accepted. So if you want to buy my work, but you live outside of the USA, just remember to make your payment as a donation. Just add up the prices of what you want in US dollars with another 25 US for the international shipping and handling fee, and your items will ship immediately. So I thank you all, and remember, felines, slam it, lick it, suck it, and see you, Space Cowboy.